Jarosław Urbar jest doktorem, naukowcem w Instytucie Fizyki Atmosferycznej Czeskiej Akademii Nauk. Od 2009 roku delegatem do Rady ESA Space Situation Awareness. Jarosław generalnie jest chyba bardzo skromną osobą, podał nam bardzo lakoniczne bio, więc myślę, że może o sobie opowie więcej. Jarosław, can you hear us? Please, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, greetings, everybody. So, as you heard, uh, my name is Jarosław Kubasz. I'm uh, unluckily not able to be uh, there with you personally, like uh, I was two years ago, but uh, I hope my presentation will be still interesting for you, even presented virtually. So, as you have heard, uh, I'm uh, mostly coming from the science field, working uh, for some time at the Institute of Atmospheric Physics of the Institute of uh, Czech uh, Physical Sciences, but uh, currently I'm postdoctoral researcher at uh, Italian INGV, also focusing on geophysical and space research. But uh, this is more focused definitely for the popularization of what uh, is within this uh, scientific discipline. Okay. So uh, I hope everybody can understand. Uh, so uh, I don't know if uh, it's going to be translated uh, now. <laughs> so, uh, the title of this talk is Space Weather Effects on the Atmosphere. So, uh, what uh, does it mean? What are the space weather effects on the atmosphere? So, you all know the standard tropospheric weather, which is uh, what uh, all we live in. The trop troposphere is the lowest uh, part of the atmosphere. So, uh, everything is uh, growing and traveling in the troposphere, except for instance, uh, what we are concerned about here mostly, the stratospheric balloons, which uh, is still uh, mostly uh, concerned with the stratospheric so-called meteorological weather and climate. So the, our balloons in stratosphere are also moving uh, due to the winds in the stratosphere, but that is still meteorological weather and climate. But it's still different to what I will be speaking about today because uh, what uh, are we going to discuss now are the influences coming up from the space. So it's called space weather, but uh, after all, it's influencing uh, the troposphere and also uh, very much the stratosphere in which our balloons are moving. So let's go more to the details. As you all know, uh, the space weather, as uh, you can expect, is mostly influenced by the sun. So, uh, as uh, you have heard, the sun is not uh, just the orange ball of the sky, but uh, it con it's consisting of several zones or layers from the inner co core of the sun, which is a couple of million degrees uh, uh, hot, coming uh, to the uh, solar surface, which is only above 6,000 uh, Celsius. But uh, the outer corona, which is now heavily researched, is uh, even uh, it's again quite warm, but uh, what are we going to speak now are mostly the influences of the sun. So uh, these influences are coming as part of the uh, some kind of coronal mass ejections, which are uh, just the sometimes uh, spontaneous eruptions from the sun. But what is coming to us all the time is so-called the solar wind. So it's called wind, so it's blowing uh, all the time. And uh, it's kind of outward expansion of that coronal plasma, which is going all the way and farther than Pluto. And it's influencing uh, all the way our region uh, of the uh, solar system, which is called the heliosphere. So the heliosphere, all of it, almost everywhere our spacecraft has traveled, is influenced by the solar wind and the uh, weather, which sun is uh, influencing our uh, heliosphere, our uh, solar system. But uh, when we are coming closer to the Earth, which we are more interested now, is uh, what is in going uh, in the uh, sphere uh, associated with the Earth. So it's all uh, controlled mainly by the uh, Earth magnetic field, because we are lucky that our planet has the magnetic field, and it's protecting us with all of these influences of the space weather, including the solar wind particles, 
and uh, also the coronal mass ejections and even more the radiation environment, which we will be speaking later. So this magnetic field is kind of uh, tilting it to the sides. And um, as you can see, the shape of the Earth magnetosphere, the magnetosphere, it's not sphere, but it's uh, kind of conical shape. Uh, and it's uh, the direct result of being impacted by the solar wind, the, its pressure coming from the sun. So it's compressed on that sunward side and it's el elongated very far on the nine side. It's actually uh, having uh, almost hundreds of thousand kilometers and even more sometimes. And it's very long on that side of the tail, which is called magneto tail. And uh, where it's the interaction region, it's called uh, shock wave, where the solar wind is encountering the Earth magnetosphere. And uh, it's called the bow shock because uh, the solar wind parameters and the conditions are abruptly by shock changing very fast. And it's slowing and diverting uh, the solar wind to the sides. So luckily for us, so our, we are not under direct influence of that solar wind. But okay, what is more important for us are uh, the solar activity changes, because the changes are what is influencing the weather and the climate, which is after all influencing all what is in the stratosphere and uh, our atmosphere we are living. So those solar interactions are uh, including not only the sun spots we can see on the sun as the, uh, as the black dots, because they are just a few couple of hundreds uh, Celsius uh, colder than the rest of the sun. So just by this uh, relative uh, difference between 6,500 and 6,000 degrees. So uh, it's just changing this color difference. So all is relative as I <laughs> said. And, uh, but what is influencing definitely more the space weather are such kind of uh, abrupt phenomena as solar flares, prominences, and uh, coronal mass ejections uh, mostly. And it's influencing also, also uh, our near Earth environmental conditions. But as I will show you later, our modern society heavily depends on many technologies which are susceptible, which are very uh, sensitive to space weather. And uh, what our um, sun can provide or cause are the geomagnetic storms, which mean that the earth magnetic field can really be jumping, changing the direction and so on slightly. And it can disrupt many uh, satellite communication and navigations, which uh, we will discuss later, also uh, causing deep uh, blackouts. But uh, what also we will be uh, speaking more are uh, influences of the radiation. So the high energy particles, the radiation, are mostly coming from outside of the solar system, outside of our uh, uh, orbit of the uh, Pluto or, or uh, even outside of the galaxy. And uh, there are very energetic particle and uh, radiation which are, which are influencing our Earth system as well. Some of them, the lower energies are still coming from the sun but the most of the problematic radiation is coming from outside of the solar system. And the highest energies of these single particles which are coming can have energies which have more energy, the single particle, than tennis ball, which is launched at speeds faster than any te tennis player can perform. So imagine just one single particle, for instance, uh, iron core can have more energy than the huge a tennis ball, which is including uh, trillions of particles and still launched faster than the one tennis ball. So really the universe is kind of unpredictable and it's, we still don't know exactly what are the causes of these particles. But okay, let's go from outside of the solar system back to the Earth. And what we are most interested about are the space weather effects on the, um, our space uh, or uh, ground-based modern society systems. So let's come uh, from the uh, space systems. So uh, the different causes of the space weather can influence, uh, as I mentioned, the radiation environment, which is influencing uh, the astronauts. You probably have heard that be between the last two Apollo uh, expeditions uh, to the moon, 
So there was quite strong uh, corner mass ejection coming from the sun that the radiation environment was so strong between those two last Apollo missions that if uh, they would be just going to the moon at that time, uh, probably all of these astronauts would uh, suffer from uh, acute radiation sickness and uh, they would probably have a lot of trouble returning home and surely they wouldn't live so long as uh, most of them did after all. So uh, this is uh, just the effect of the coronal mass ejections uh, launching the solar uh, radiation, which is uh, quite strong. But still, uh, one might uh, expect that uh, during uh, the times when sun is uh, silent, when there are no eruptions and no solar storms, the uh, radiation environment for astronauts is okay and they don't have to worry about anything. But it's not true, unluckily, because our sun is also having different effects. It's having the effect of what I mentioned with the solar wind, uh, providing the pressure uh, to the, not only to the Earth magnetosphere, but uh, the pressure press, pressing out from the solar system all the cosmic rays. So when there is higher solar activity, the cosmic rays coming into uh, our solar system from outer universe uh, is not so strong because they are pressed outside just by the solar wave. So it's meaning that um, if we would be going to Mars, uh, then uh, the situation is more complicated. It might be actually better to go during the strong solar activity when uh, the sun is, uh, and we can predict that the solar storm is coming and the astronauts can potentially hide. Then uh, it would be maybe more uh, having the more radiation uh, damage to the astronauts when they would go during the period of uh, low solar activity when there are more cosmic rays coming from the outer solar system and which can be damaged to the health. Yeah, I uh, forgot to mention that the solar activity is quite periodic. So every about 11 years, uh, it's changing from the solar maximum to solar minimum. So every 11 years, there is a uh, kind of periodic change between the activity. And um, so for the astronauts coming to the moon, it's uh, quite uh, uh, not so complicated because they are outside of the influence of the Earth uh, magnetosphere. But inside the Earth magnetosphere for the satellites, it's uh, actually quite uh, much more complicated because uh, they are energetic radiation belt particles um, due to the configuration we will speak later. And uh, these uh, energetic radiation bell particles are those which are damaging uh, the spacecraft actually the most because they are, most of them are inside the Earth magnetosphere and uh, some part of these uh, radiation belts. So it can be damaging the solar cells. Actually, uh, there is also uh, charged particles charging uh, which is influencing the magnitude attitude control and so on, so on. But uh, what is uh, actually uh, also uh, important is uh, not only this uh, uh, kind of uh, radiation uh, by the <coughs> incoming uh, ionization particles, radiation to be uh, said, but also the uh, photon, solar photons, which are also having some effects like uh, the UV degradation and so on, which is not changing very much in the, those high at, uh, altitudes, but still are influencing. Overall, the last important part of the effects on the satellites is the enhanced spacecraft drag. This is only because the, when the solar activity is higher, uh, the UV radiation and so on, it's uh, kind of heating up more the higher levels of the Earth atmosphere. So when the solar activity is higher, actually at uh, higher altitudes, uh, there are more neutral particles in the Earth atmosphere where the spacecraft are orbiting. So the drag is actually the slowdown of these particles on the orbit. So when somebody is predicting that the lifetime of the satellite would be 10 years, so when there is a kind of unpredicted high solar activity during this solar maximum, so it can go even to, let's say, seven years of orbital lifetime, and then the satellite will just burn in the atmosphere. So 
really the, the effect is quite important as well. But let's go closer back to the Earth. It's uh, the Earth's ionosphere. We will discuss more about that later. So maybe I will just jump uh, over that now. It's uh, actually only uh, to say it's charged uh, layer having a lot of uh, electrons in the atmosphere. And it's influencing the signal transmission between the satellites, but uh, also radio by the radio wave disturbances. But it's not only transmissions, but also the navigation signals. So also the active uh, space weather can be influencing not only satellite communications, but also the GPS positioning, which is quite important these days. But uh, let's go back to the radiation, which is incoming into the solar system, uh, into the atmosphere and to the lower uh, layers. It's, um, so the radiation, it's not influencing only the astronauts. It's also, it can influence pretty much during the uh, strong activity, during the strong solar activity. Also the uh, aircraft passengers and radiation on the flights, mostly coming uh, above uh, the Arctic areas where the influence on the atmosphere is stronger. So for instance, when you fly to New York, uh, the uh, flight is going quite often above Greenland, but these days it's working already that uh, these air traffic controllers know there is some space weather event coming. So even because of this already, the flights are uh, going slightly to lower, uh, geographic latitude. So the flight wouldn't go over Greenland, but just south of Greenland, for instance. So then you can imagine it's pretty important because otherwise they would not do it because uh, they would uh, waste more fuel just, with, just by doing that. But what is very nice effect, uh, not only speaking about the bit, but influence of the space weather are uh, actually the atmospheric effects, what uh, the first people have observed in the Arctic area. So the aurora borealis, the northern lights, and I will come later to what is influencing them, but it's basically the particles which are going through from uh, the sun, which are going through the atmosphere and uh, exciting the uh, neutral atmosphere about these Arctic regions. What is also mostly happening uh, in the Arctic regions, but it can happen also above Europe uh, during the Geoma uh, during the strong solar storms are so-called geomagnetically induced currents in power systems. It happens that way, like dynamo. Okay, these days you don't have dynamo in your bicycle, but maybe you remember <coughs> the bicycle <coughs> of your grandmother, which had your dynamo, and you know how the dynamo works. So, <coughs> sorry. So when the uh, geomagnetic storm is coming, so the magnetic field in the Earth are changing that much that only this change can induce, uh, like the dynamo effect, induce the currents, electric currents in the power systems. And really it has some effects like in 1989 in Canada, all of these uh, parasitic currents coming from the solar storm burnt tra transformers in the uh, power systems in Canada. So actually tens of thousands of people were without the electricity for a couple of weeks. And the same way it can actually induce currents in pump pipelines uh, <clears throat> and there uh, it's resulting in the corrosion. So uh, let's go <clears throat> to the also more interesting uh, upper atmospheric effects, which possibly can be already seen from the balloons. <clears throat> Actually, uh, these upper atmospheric lightnings and these uh, optical effects uh, were only observed during the end of the 80s uh, by the uh, fighter pilots, which uh, previously didn't report that because uh, the people would uh, expect or their bosses would expect uh, they are crazy <laughs> because it looks like nuclear explosions. So we are speaking about effects which are above the normal clouds above the uh, tropospheric clouds and coming to the between altitudes between 50 and 100 de degrees. It's called in English transient luminous events and the uh, name of transient it's because they are very very fast. It's just for the fraction of second you can see such kind of very nice 
upper atmospheric lightning. So that was the reason why it wasn't reported uh, till the beginning of uh, 1990s. That uh, then uh, uh, more and more uh, pilots realized that uh, it's probably not uh, them being crazy or having some issues with their eyes, but uh, they have seen such kind of blinks of, uh, above uh, the clouds. So nowadays, uh, these uh, effects or optical um, interesting phenomena are being measured by the high-speed cameras. So these high-speed cameras are mostly uh, placed on the ground and uh, they, are, uh, they are mostly pointed above some clouds in the mostly above in the horizontal direction into very far, uh, very far uh, thunderstorms. And uh, they are not looking down to the normal uh, thunderstorms uh, below these 20 kilometers, but uh, they are looking above these thunderclouds and quite often they can see quite uh, very nice effects. And these days it's uh, very often to uh, measure such kind of very interesting elves, hello and gigantic. So this is also potential for the stratospheric experiment to observe these, but still these high-speed cameras are quite expensive. So finally coming uh, to the stratospheric research or possible directions. So uh, again, what is uh, important for also strat uh, stratospheric experiments already is the ionosphere. That's due to the signal propagation. The ionosphere is uh, the charged part uh, of the atmosphere, which is uh, having uh, the charged particles from the so our UV radiation, uh, exciting them this uh, layer mostly more than 100 kilometers above till the altitudes of about 1,000 kilometers. And uh, this layer is important for the propagation of radio frequency signals in the medium frequency, high frequency, very high frequency. And uh, depending on the frequency, it's being reflected from the ionosphere and it can travel very far. So you can see that uh, actually uh, the temperature and the profile, it's uh, uh, quite different, but what is important is the electron density. That's the number of charged particles in the cubic centimeter. And you see that a most significant charge uh, is deposited in the layers from more than 100 kilometers uh, till, and highest is about 300 kilometers, which is the so-called F layer. And this F layer is present in the ionosphere during both <coughs> day and night. And it's uh, providing actually the AM radio transmitter reflection. So these AM radio waves can be reflecting all the way over the earth globe because the reflection is from the F layer and going back to the ground reflection and many times back. So that's the reason why radio amateurs can hear the, uh, some other radio amateurs, for instance, or radio stations from Japan in Europe. And also that uh, the reason is that uh, it's many times reflected during the specific conditions and then it's pretty good. But also the reason why uh, higher frequencies are not reflected are that uh, then they would be reflected from the lower layers of the ionosphere. And these lower layers of uh, ionosphere are only present during daytime. And uh, it's because the solar radiation is what is mainly uh, uh, providing these particles in the lower layers of atmosphere. So the signal, radio signal propagation for long distance is also very important to know the current space weather because it can change dramatically the conditions if you will uh, be able to record, let's say, the radio matter from Japan or not. <laughs> okay, and just a quick note uh, for this measuring of the conditions in the ionosphere, they are um, being used the big uh, ionospheric sounders. They are called ionosons. They are working already for a couple of, uh, let's say, decades. So it's from the 50s, basically. Some of them are sounding for vertically. So they send the radio frequency signal to the ionosphere, which is then reflected back. Uh, and the time delay, which is measured, is providing <coughs> the details about the conditions in the ionosphere. But for instance, 
uh, from Prague, uh, from Kulonica, there is uh, such kind of uh, uh, oblique communication signal between the ion zones from Prague and Hungary, nearby Chopron. In Chopron, there is a uh, reception of uh, uh, Digisond, which is uh, also able to measure the conditions between Prague and Chopron. So we are also monitoring uh, here the conditions pretty well. But OK, let's not make it uh, too scientific enough. But what I wanted is uh, to provide also some body, body, <laughs> some, um, some, let's say, kind of uh, motivation for the students. Um, this is uh, from some of the experiments we performed like 14 and 13 years ago as young students, which is open to all of us. Uh, it's called uh, Rexus Vexus Stratospheric Volume Experiment, which is Vexus. And for Vexus, for the volumes, it's uh, yeah, unluckily the uh, round is only every October, so this time it's closed. Um, but uh, it's every year, so you can uh, prepare your experiment for the, to submit a proposal to uh, European Space Agency Education Program uh, for different types of stratospheric uh, balloon experiments or rockets, if you would prefer it. And uh, there, the helium balloon, which is launched, is really huge. It can have 2,000 cubic meters, and it's really heavy. Then the gondola, it's uh, really big, they have very good telemetry, so they can measure a lot of different phenomena uh, from the experiments. It's not limited bandwidth, and uh, the flights were within five hours. So uh, there, it was a very interesting learning curve, as I'm shown here. So for instance, we try to save uh, on the rechargeable lithium batteries we ordered from uh, China, but uh, it wasn't uh, even if it was in the data sheet, there wasn't the uh, protection circuit. So take care of the batteries which you are going to send into, uh, into stratosphere because the, uh, uh, it can be uh, exploding. We were lucky that it exploded already during the charging on the ground 14 days before our campaign. So we were able to uh, quickly uh, put their different uh, uh, lithium batteries which were fine for the experiment and after all it was successful. The batteries are most often the problem there. So there are some more pictures from the uh, experiment, which as I say, it's do it yourself is the great motivation. But on the other way here, you are really uh, working with a lot of experts, a lot of equipment of the stratospheric uh, type. So it's different than what you really do it yourself, as we heard in the last presentation, for instance, in Poland, and also our Slovak colleagues have a lot of experiences. This was that we designed only the experiment itself, and all other was provided to us. Yes, so it was the flight of three hours, and uh, some of the test of the equipment was really like space grade, so we also needed to uh, not to do only the thermal design and structure design, but also test it. So this is one specific case when we tested our uh, stratospheric box. So definitely it was over designed, as you can see here. <laughs> but uh, let's go to the uh, effects, what we were measuring uh, almost there, or which are slightly at the higher levels, are the uh, cosmic rays. I forgot to say that these um, deck vectors we introduced to the stratosphere by the student experiment later uh, has flown the same detector on the Proba V spacecraft, and it's actually still measuring. Um, so it started measuring uh, in 2014, and it's still working. And so uh, it's providing very interesting measurements of uh, uh, Earth radiation belts. As you can see here, you probably heard about South Atlantic anomaly, which really you see about the South Atlantic area, where there are much more electron fluxes than uh, elsewhere in that uh, height of the atmosphere, which is uh, making some trouble uh, to the spacecraft uh, orbiting at that altitude. So that's the reason why it's important to measure. And I wouldn't go into the details of the uh, contribution of the into the radiation dose of those different types of particles. But uh, what is most important to say that, uh, that there are different uh, fluxes and energies of these. For instance, those higher energetic particles, which I mentioned 
like uh, tennis ball uh, flying at high speed are coming very infrequently. There are just few of them every hundred of years for the specific area. So that you cannot expect to measure. What you can expect to measure, for instance, in stratosphere are mostly the effects of the aurora electrons because they are coming quite often. As you can see, there are many of them uh, in every cubic centimeters per second. Okay, so, but uh, what is mostly relating to the stratospheric environment are actually the cosmic ray air showers. Because uh, even though, as I mentioned, there are very few of them coming uh, with very high energies, our atmosphere is actually uh, multiplying them. So uh, even though when it's a very uh, high energy particle, at the, uh, as you can see in this ink plot, so for instance, if you have uh, iron nuclei coming from uh, other galaxies or from out of the solar system, um, at the height of 35 uh, kilometers in the Earth atmosphere, it uh, runs into the other nucleus and it's making the air showers. So that's the reason why in the higher atmosphere there are a lot of these uh, radiation just because of that. And this is also the reason why on, aircraft, on the aircraft on the flights, uh, the radiation is quite high during uh, the stronger uh, activity of the space weather. And uh, so it's uh, important actually to say that uh, it's these cosmic rays are uh, the most important uh, or the practically only ionization source at altitude between three kilometers and 35 kilometers. And uh, what you might be also interested about is that it's uh, very as, as very much associated with the cosmic rays and the lightning. The lightning, now we are speaking about the standard clouds. So the atmospheric clouds are, uh, there are a lot of theories, but probably it's uh, still uh, it, the most uh, uh, probable theory, which uh, is, uh, that the atmospheric lightning, the normal lightning, is initiated by such kind of cosmic rays coming often from the sun or elsewhere. And uh, it's really influencing what are the atmospheric air showers coming and also associated with the lightning sparks which are there. So this is also the potential uh, area of research in the stratosphere. But it's problematic because uh, it's uh, quite dangerous to launch stratospheric balloon directly into the uh, thunderstorm. But uh, what was done for many years uh, till now uh, are uh, standard radio sounds, which are basically the measurements uh, of in the stratospheric or meteorologic balloon. And it was including the standard uh, the Geiger counter. So uh, we have done also earlier that kind of measurement and so, uh, as you can see it in very old profile that uh, on the ground level there was uh, very low radiation level and um, when we flew on the balloon for these couple of hours there was much higher um, single hits in these uh, due to uh, detectors of charged particles and when th there were double hits by the red line uh, at the same time when the particle traversed both of them uh, the uh, tubes uh, simultaneously, these gas discharge counters, um, we got uh, the double measurement. So there were really uh, strong particles traversing both of the tubes. And uh, this kind of sender is standard Geiger sender and you can uh, use it and you can get it for cheap and you can uh, launch it on your stratospheric uh, balloon and do it very simply like that. But actually uh, this was done in Russia uh, from the low latitudes uh, till all the way till Murmansk, because as mentioned, uh, for higher geographic latitudes, the effects are stronger. What is here on this plot? As uh, I mentioned, it's coming from 1957 when there was the start of such kind of uh, activities of geophysical, uh, international geophysical year, and the measurements were, uh, as you can see, uh, you can see the period of those above 11 years. So these 11 years, it's not by chance, it's confirmed that it's not just correlation, but it's cost. It's 
caused by the solar activity, which I mentioned, it's also periodic uh, every 11 years. And by the color coding, you can see that the particle fluxes are much higher at the, at the higher altitudes. So when you are going uh, to the 25 kilometers or higher, so where your stratospheric balloons are uh, flying, there the fluxes uh, and the changes uh, are higher, uh, are the highest due to the uh, changing space weather. Okay, so, but uh, on our previous experiments, like students, uh, we were lucky not to have only the standard Geiger counters I have shown on previous slide, but also we had uh, the, these imaging ionizing radiation detector Medipix, which was developed at CERN in Geneva. And uh, it's including such kind of pixelated matrix, so something like CCD, but you can uh, having, you are having the detector sensor and charge collector, which after amplification and discrimination can count the particles. So the energy deposited in these detector sensors is transformed into the charge. And then we can actually uh, get by the readout electron, it's such kind of nice pictures of the charged particles which were there. So this is actually summed over the different times. Still, there are many different charged particles like heavy charged particles. You can see here, the X-rays and gamma are uh, providing only the small dots and so on. But if there were the fast charged particles uh, running very fast, there are lines, but then uh, it was possible to also differentiate by uh, also different charged particles by the way how they curved in the detection. So that experiment was, I have already shown you our old uh, experiment box, which was kind of structurally over-designed, but uh, it was no problem for that experiment because the gondola had 100 kilo. And we actually had two different types of uh, detectors with also the neutron converter, because this is the, the white material here, which is able to convert atmospheric neutrons uh, to the charged radiation that way. And uh, it actually proved to be successful. And ESA is thinking to using this kind of technique to detect the Mars underground water that way, because it's mostly shown on the net neutrons. But back to the stratospheric experiment, if you uh, sign up and you are selected for this ESA Texas experiment, the balloon are usually launched during autumn time when there is the stratospheric vortex. Uh, the winds in the Arctic are usually blowing uh, to the east. So just because of that, uh, you can fly only about two or three hours because then you are coming close to the border with Russia, which is which then the experiment has to be stopped. So we were lucky that uh, our balloon landed just next to the uh, river. Otherwise, it would be quite problematic because by that time, the detectors were quite expensive. And this is just a very <laughs> early profile of uh, the changes of the temperature in our uh, measurement. And uh, because uh, we used mostly the thermal capacity of these over-designed experiments. You can see we are, we are having some uh, big uh, metal pieces and it was used just to keep the temperature uh, of the experiment high. Okay, after all, it was heavily insulated, but this is open box without the insulation before. So as you all know, uh, the temperature there is quite problematic for a lot of uh, electronics. So there are different ways how to deal with it. Probably you have had uh, only needed to uh, have the electronics which can withstand such kind of lower temperature because you cannot keep such high mass, which uh, for some hours can uh, keep the heat and just heat up uh, the electronics. And you probably, because of the mass limit, need to use only the uh, insulation limitation. But okay, that flight was uh, quite successful for uh, more than three hours. And we have measured uh, quite interesting profiles, which uh, actually enabled us to uh, include into some model. So uh, you can see that at the altitudes, which is here it in hundreds of meters. So for instance, here we are at the five kilometers, 10 kilometers, but you see that the measurements and the hits in our detector 
uh, began to rise when we uh, went up of uh, five kilometers and then stabilized above, let's say, 17 kilometers. So the conditions between the 17 kilometers are higher are basically the same. So, uh, but it's rising up pretty much from those five kilometers. So uh, we uh, were lucky that we contributed to the model of cosmic ray induced ionization. So only those young students were uh, happy that uh, it was actually uh, stratospheric measurements, which was useful just to fit the model with the parameters. The black dots are the model parameters fitted by our measurements, but it's very early plotted. And here are some more nice pictures what we have seen on these uh, energy calibrated detectors, such kind of radiation uh, going through our uh, detectors, which are separated to the different types. So uh, yeah, and the main result was that uh, in the Arctic uh, stratosphere to say, they are uh, changing uh, different contributions of types of the particles due to the atmospheric air showers. So for instance, you see that uh, till the altitude, which is on the x-axis, till the 5,000 meters, you don't have the straight tracks, which are mostly associated by the uh, different populations, but uh, also the heavy tracks are all only coming from the seven kilometers altitude, which is problematic from the radiation dose. So for the flights, if you fly on space on a uh, plane in less than seven kilometers height, then it's uh, usually not so big problem from the radiation environment. Okay, and um, about the ionization. <laughs> you probably heard about the ground ozone and the ionizers. Um, you, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, from the cosmic rays, uh, the ionization is mainly between 3 and 35 kilometers. So below that, it's because of some processes on the ground uh, associated actually with the lightning itself. Which is, uh, which is splitting the ozone and making some radicals. And these radicals are then um, in the, uh, in the uh, troposphere uh, flowing everywhere. And it can be sometimes uh, good for your health, maybe even during winter, just to breathe some ion slightly ionized uh, air in the uh, rooms and that's the reason why you feel good also in the mountains because there is more uh, ionized uh, air from that. So uh, this is also kind of interesting research because uh, there are a lot of models for how big ionization is coming from uh, the cosmic radiation in the mountains and it's quite interesting and you can contact me if you would like to hear more about it. What is more relevant to the space weather is that uh, here on the uh, x-axis, there is atmospheric depth, which is uh, associated to the altitude. So uh, in the scale of altitude, there is different cosmic ray induced ionization, which is the ionization we are speaking about. So uh, in the x-axis, the geomagnetic cutoff is associated with the latitude. So here you have equator, here you have, for instance, Europe, and here you have uh, poles, or let's say, northern, northern, northern uh, Norway, Norway or Svalbard can be here. So when you will launch uh, your balloon from uh, Scandinavia, for instance, from Estrange, you will get much higher level of uh, ionization at the altitudes between, okay, between 10 and 15 kilometers, as we discussed before, and what was our measurement as well. Here you can see the same on the map that actually in the uh, high uh, altitude, in the three kilometers altitude, there is almost no kind of radiation, but in the 10 kilometers, it's already important in the high latitudes. So that's also the reason why I mentioned when the activity is even stronger than this, it's uh, advisable not to travel uh, by the airplane over the uh, over the Greenland because the radiation can be pretty high there, even much higher than here at these altitudes. Well, flight altitudes are even slightly different than this. For instance, in 20 kilometers, it's even more significant. So for uh, stratospheric balloon altitudes, uh, you would get much higher readings when you measure over the Greenland or in Antarctica. That's the reason 
apply actually the cosmic ray research for on Antarctic stratospheric balance is being uh, undertaken because such kind of uh, radiation research is much cheaper than done from the spacecraft. But in the Antarctica, there is one big advantage for uh, stratospheric ballooning. You heard about uh, Arctic vortex, but Antarctic vortex, which is which are the stratospheric winds, which are basically circul uh, circulating around the southern pole, and are allowing that the stratospheric balloons launch from Antarctica can uh, be uh, quite stable in the stratosphere for a few months, even for three months. It can be during uh, the uh, during the polar night there. So uh, the measurements are quite often launched from Antarctica from that reason that the work, that the winds all are uh, circulating Antarctica very stable way. And you can be sure that you can be measuring there for many months if you need high statistics for your results. Okay, and uh, for even higher altitudes, uh, uh, it's associated with the geomagnetic pole, which are uh, more to the sites of, uh, for instance, Northern Canada. You probably heard that the magnetic poles are not uh, magnetic pole are not above the geographic pole, but slightly tilted. So the particles are traveling along the magnetic lines together. And just the last slide, what I wanted to show. So this was done with the same detector we used you know, 13, 14 years ago on the stratospheric balloon, the time picks. But this was uh, just the measurement before it was launched into space by the detector. So here you can see by uh, the logarithmic scale, the dose rate, the, the radiation you would get and the fluxes of the particles. So for instance, you see that uh, the different dose rates by the black lines are, uh, are only, uh, let's say twice strong gamma uh, particle, uh, by the gamma testing in the laboratory because this was uh, also some testing before it was uh, launched. And but the aircraft flights which were there are uh, more than 10 times stronger. So if you are flying by the aircraft, you are getting uh, at least 10 times more dose than at the background. And it can get much higher if you travel over Greenland, for instance. But in the space environment, it's 100 times stronger than it's on the ground level. So that's the problem for astronauts. That's the reason why we need it. And I think by this, uh, it concludes my presentation. I hope you uh, get at least part of it. Sorry, I was quick. And so the questions are welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mariusz Koda. I am a member of the Polish Space Professional Association. Thank you very much for your lecture, first of all. Uh, I think that the space weather issue is uh, gaining importance because of rising number of space objects, especially um, because of rising number of satellites. Uh, we are talking about, of course, uh, for example, a Starlink mega constellation, one web mega constellation. Yes, uh, in the United States, uh, we have a brand new legislation, Space Weather Act. Uh, from 2020, which uh, has created a coordination system, information system, uh, with a leading role of uh, North uh, Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric uh, Administration. We don't have uh, such, a uh, such a legislation in Poland. Uh, what about Czech Republic? And tell me, what do you think about this, such a legislation? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for a very interesting question. Yeah, you are completely right. It's uh, very related to the space weather issue. Um, there are uh, two ways how it's related. Actually, uh, concerning the legislation, it's really important because maybe you are referring to another, uh, let's say, anti-satellite test, which was performed just a few days ago and uh, which is uh, providing a lot of space debris uh, which is uh, uh, pro making much problematic condition, mostly for these mega constellations, which are nowadays launched. And uh, how the space weather is uh, influencing uh, this uh, space debris. So um, uh, there are actually uh, different uh, particle populations uh, naturally in that environment. So here I just uh, quickly show one slide that uh, actually um, 
it was launched from uh, uh, from the uh, space shuttle. A very interesting experiment, which was uh, in the space much longer than it was expected. It was there for six years, measuring the space environment, considering the meteoroids and the effects. But uh, these micro meteoroids are there all the time. But what is influencing uh, the uh, mega constellations are the space weather in that way I mentioned from the beginning of the lecture. And when there is the stronger solar activity, uh, the neutral atmosphere, the Earth, the thermosphere is inflating. It's heated up more, so it's inflating. So it can actually help the satellite debris uh, just to deorbit or burn up in the atmosphere much faster. So uh, this is actually the quite optimistic effect of the space weather. When the solar activity is high, then uh, there are a lot of these space debris uh, burning up faster. But concerning the legislation, it's a like different part. We cannot kind of expect what will be uh, space weather conditions and for how long these uh, constellations can uh, be there and the space debris can there, but at least the European Space Agency is very active in this area that all of these uh, missions are designed, already designed, it's called um, yeah, design, uh, that uh, they are designed that um, they shouldn't cause the space debris um, itself. And they always have some uh, reserve to deorbit, they have uh, some uh, fuel to go to the parking orbit if, for instance, uh, uh, they are in the uh, uh, let's say geostationary orbit. There is some graveyard orbit, which all the satellites are coming then after to keep uh, the uh, geostationary orbit uh, uh, not so congested. But uh, really, the problem are these days with the mega constellation at the low Earth orbit when there are a lot of cascades. Uh, I have shown you the cascades of uh, cosmic rays in the Earth in the atmosphere, but it's actually nowadays starting to be the issue also with the uh, debris uh, from the uh, spacecraft collision in the orbits as well. So we really want to avoid the situation that the debris after the uh, satellite collisions would go to that way that it's uh, initiating the cascade and damaging many more satellites. So I hope you, I kind of answered your question, but <laughs> at least partial. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Yaroslav. I'm also very uh, very curious. Where are you right now? We we we, we can see like uh, planets in your ceiling. Where are you? Okay, I'm sorry that uh, it's even though as I mentioned, I'm currently postdoctoral researcher in Rome in Italy. I was there just for a couple of weeks, and uh, this is just because we have three daughters, and I'm working at home office, so. This is just for um, my daughters to have more of space inside our place. <laughs> so I'm in Prague. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very Greetings much. Everybody. Thank you for, for your presentation and an explanation. Thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and enjoy the mm -hmm. conference. Bye-bye.